Bigfoot Collectors Club presents Wet Hot Alien Summer 3 Saucerama. 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 I thought I saw a flying saucer. Saucerama. Saucerama. Flying saucers. Saucerama. Beep, beep, boop, boop. Ooh, wait, that's one classic saucer. <laughs> Saucerama. You do the horse math. Dude, it's fun. I really, I spent way too long on that. No, I, no, I didn't. <laughs> you either spent no, way too beautiful. long or not enough time. <laughs> Probably it doesn't both. matter. Hey, beep, boop, bop, bop. It just hit so... for the first time for me. You, <laughs> you get a little piece every time. Yeah, yeah. a little piece. Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to Bigfoot Collectors Club, the show where we talk to amazing guests about their personal paranormal history and share stories of high strangeness. I'm your host, Michael McMillan. With me always is your other host. Bryce Johnson. And our ultra-terrestrial producer. Riley Bray. It's just your boys back in the clubhouse yeah. this week we are ooh, in the thick <laughs> of july <laughs> and deep <clears throat> into this wet hot alien wet. summer three sasarama sasarama Sus. continues all summer long here on the main feed and our patreon bcc the other side we're delving into the classic era of the flying saucer the golden age of the ufo which falls between the years 1947 and 1960 and uh, this week we are firmly stepping into the decade of the 1950s spent a little longer this summer in the late 40s than That's i thought okay. i would <laughs> it happened. but there was just too much fun stuff there yeah, <laughs> yeah. you're setting so, the foundation you know? yeah the 50s were we're coming up on the 52 flap. We're coming up on the Flatwoods Monster. We're coming up mm. on Hopkinsville. Oh, some good cases. Some of which we might revisit in the next few weeks. We'll find out. Um, but this is the decade when UFOs and aliens really start to make their mark on both pop culture and in the realm of high strangeness. This is when it gets really fun yeah. I think mm-hmm. um, I want to remind everybody there is retro 50 style merch right now that you can get in our merch shop mm-hmm. uh, link is in the show notes to this you can find it in our link tree and all of our stuff over on our YouTube channel over on our Instagram at Bigfoot Collectors Club for both of those so uh, if you want merch you know where to find it we've also re-released the classic Wet Hot Alien Summer Vaporwave designed for a limited time yes, for the limited summer. limited time. So, yes, all of, these, your decade. all of these things are going to be gone uh, when Wet Hot Alien Summer 3 comes to an end at the end of the summer. So get it now if you oh, want it. Because then we're not going to have merch again for a while. It's not just this merch. We probably won't have merch for a while. Say that like a threat. It's true. <laughs> yeah, yeah, supply it's and demand. It's true. Um, Okay, uh, I want to do a couple things because we left some business out the last couple uh, episodes. That's true. We, oh, yeah. We have an update from Bryce about that uh, disclosure thing that he went to a few weeks back. But before we get there, let's, Riley, we got to nominate our five star club scout of the week who left us a five star review on Apple Podcasts. Of course. And this user is called MF Girl in Paris. And uh, she writes, It's cute in here. Matt Cook and his mom are adorable. Please, more sweet moms. Anyway, Michael pronounces peripheral the same way Marcy does. How do you pronounce peripheral? I think I say peripheral. Oh, there you go. (laughs) I I do like it. it (laughs) Peripheral. What is it? Peripheral. Peripheral. But I think I say peripheral. Peripheral. I like yours. It sounds nice. It's more Midwest. (laughs) Marcy's from the South, so she probably does it that way, too. They continue. I thought it was just a Marcy thing. Funny feeling podcast stand here. I adore Betsy and Marcy. So do we. But I guess it's a brother sister thing. Lol. Although I am starting to wonder if I am pronouncing it differently from everyone else, though. <laughs> I don't think so. Shrug. In any case, great pod. Good boys. Bye. <laughs> <laughs> we all we all have our little quirks. I say yeah. peripheral. Yeah. Bryce says major. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. What do you say? I don't know. What do I? What do I don't I know. Say? We haven't caught. You're perfect. No, you don't do anything wrong. I just am like sweating and scrambling when you guys show up. Like, oh, oh I'll be right with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, thank That's you, MF nice. Girl in Paris. We love you. Um, so, back in the Ryan Sprague episode, yes. you teased that you were. Uh, this is the, the mid mid June. We're in mid July now. Yeah, sorry, time everyone. Machine. Right, sorry. We're in the time machine. You were going to meet. Lu- or go to at least hear Louis Alizondo. Yes, I went to a private disclosure party uh, somewhere in Los Angeles near the ocean. This house was huge in the Palisades. Oh my God! Wow. Yeah, fancy parts, fancy pants party. No, so it was put on by the New Paradigm Institute. Um, 
And they're trying to sort of, this is run by a, a, a guy named Danny Sheehan. Now you may know him. My name rings a bell. He is a lawyer like uh, supreme. He worked on the, with F. Lee Bailey in the Watergate cases. He's uh, Karen Silkwood, the Iran Contra. He's oh done some landmark. Is he American- like one of these Alan Dershowitz who's like ended up being on the, um, the, 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 the Epstein Island flight list? No, no, no. Is he on the logs? <laughs> you know, he worked with God, John Mack and gave Getting together. Remember when the Harvard tried to fire John Mack? I well, think Dershowitz did too. Uh, anyway, yes. Yeah, so uh, yeah, you're right. He, but but anyway, so he's a very uh, incredible guy. But anyway, he had hosted Lou Alizondo, who came to talk about you know his role uh, running, uh, being the chief of security for A Tip and A Swap, and and man, I got it. And there was some you know Henry Zabrowski from last podcast we love was there. Oh. Shout out Henry. <laughs> Uh, there's, so there's a, dude. I ran into Henry uh, a couple weeks ago in Burbank too. So we're, oh, yeah. we're orbiting everywhere. around. I love yeah. Henry cool. so Whitley much. Streber from community. Shut up was there. brother. Yes. Whitley Streber was there. The Streeps. Yes. Yes. The yes. Yeah. Yes. Stage. yeah. Well, so and, was there a great alien in the smoking jacket? No, 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 no. It's funny. I, was actually, George Norrie there? No, it, it's funny. As we sort Did of you hear anyone in the crowd go, anyone who doesn't like women should be locked it, up. It should be locked up. <laughs> uh, uh, as you, as I'm My sort of, Nori quote of all walking that. through this corridor of, of lawn, you see these little billboards and it's like, the first one is like Lou Elizondo hero. And it's like, and then it's like another billboard, Chuck Schumer. Thanks you. Thank you. And then it's like uh hero. And you're just like, Oh boy. Uh, but you know, <laughs> um, listen, when I, when, when, when he actually did talk, man, I was sort of like, it was so nice to hear it from the horse's mouth. Now, yeah. now you need I, some set setup stage here. a little bit more. You're in a house. Like, what do you sit? No, where we're are you outside. Sitting? Sitting. We're just okay. outside on this lawn. Garden night. party. Yeah, garden party. Is there a uh, pool? No, uh, dude, There's a, the LA River is flowing through the property. It's Whoa. like, yeah, it's like. So this is like grounds. Yes, it's like a side of a canyon. Okay, is what this, this is, is where like an episode of Magnum P.I. would yeah. take. Yeah, oh, 100%. <laughs> like this, is 100%. A, this is a cold open of yeah. like a procedural where someone in this UFO circle gets murdered yes. and yes. everyone yes. in attendance is oh the suspect. Yeah, Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, no, I'm, 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 eat, I'm eating free, the food because I just had a massive chest workout. So I'm eating all their all their uh, nice. meatball subs. And But anyway, so yeah. They, <laughs> I love that. They, Bryce is in the back uh, just, who is just this? housing <laughs> Who's that man eating all the meatballs? <laughs> up? So <laughs> <Sub Zabrowski. laughs> uh, But anyway, so uh, yeah, no, they t- it was you know it was it was a little laborious here. And we did a little, 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 the blah. intros, yeah. yeah, the intros. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but finally, when Lou just, gets on, just mouth full of meatball, <laughs> cut to the chase. <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, so Lou, George Norian, you here. know, <laughs> Lou finally gets up, man, and uh, and man, you just hear him when he talks about it. You just know he's speaking what his truth, you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, he's like warheads on foreheads, man. I just put, you know, I did this and I did that and security. And he's like, I'm not a UFO guy. He's like, I'm a national security guy, you know? Yeah. And, and when he talks about sort of what some of these pilots are, are witnessing and encountering on radar and in person and, and just how sensitive this equipment is. Right. And like how trained these fucking pilots are. Seriously. He's like, you've only seen the declassified videos of the Tic Tac. I've seen the 4k stuff and it'll blow your fucking mind. Was because- Corbell there? No, no, because Jeremy wasn't there. No, because he's like that. They have that stuff. It's just not declassified. Yeah. And congressmen have seen it, that. and it takes place twenty feet in front of this man's cockpit. Um, but so when you just hear him talk, you get a sense of like, okay, I believe this guy. Yeah, wow. that's it. That's all it is. So I've read his words. He's got a, you know, and it's like you see him on TV doing interviews. But when you hear him talk, when you hear him answer questions, you go. Mm-hmm. Okay, I bet I bet this guy worked with those programs, doing what he said he did, and obviously, you know. And it always this is what I love about this subject because you you you've heard us talk on here. We can get very esoteric, man. The, the UFO represents a symbol in the sky, man. But then he's like, no, 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 no. There's there's shit landing here, and it has pilots, and we don't know where it comes from, but we're collecting. So it. you get a wow. sense that he thinks it's extraterrestrial. Y- 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 he never you yeah yeah. They're positive or, or that. ultra terrestrial or whatever. I think, yeah, I think that, yeah, or whatever, exactly. You know, and I always take it with a grain of salt. I never try. I, I came in there going, I'm not going to believe everything I hear here today. You know, just because I like to keep a little bit of distance. I, you know, you never know what's what's disinformation. Or, I just pictured yeah. him being like, you know, does anyone know what I talk about? Yeah. I'm talking about. I do, I do, sir. I believe you. I believe you, sir. Thank you so much for your work. Uh, no, I did sell. I said thank you for. I got to meet him. 
you I, met said, him? I said, yeah. Ryan Sprague says hello. He said, great guy. Thank you. And I said, and thank you for your service, you know, because I do believe he w- worked in the military and he he's a patriot. So what other elbows right did you rub while you were there? Um, that's it with the friends who invited me. And uh, Jim Perry was there from the Euphemed oh, podcast. Nice. Cool. A shout Good out Jim. to Jim. And then, uh, yeah, it was uh, just a scrambling of a couple people. So I had a good time. I missed you guys. Uh, what I, you know, I'm a, I'm a lone wolf on things, but when it, when it's that fun stuff like that, I need a partner in crime. I was you know? writing today's episode. I couldn't go. So. I know. Get a plus one next time. Yeah, yeah. I'll get a plus one <laughs> next time. But it was fun. Uh, you plus know, two. they're working hard to sort of. Uh, uh, work it through the proper channels of Congress to 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 sort of set the stage for how we're going to deal with this in the future. And and with wow. what what they were talking about, I was like, I can get down with this. And I read some, and, you know, and even this guy Sheehan, you know, I heard some coded language in there that I like talking about, like, you know. Um, just like the transformation of consciousness that needs to take place, you mm. know? And it's just like, so I heard some words that I liked, you know? Mm. Um, and so I, I, it was great there. Uh, a couple other questions I have. Mm. Did you spot any like unmarked black cars parked in the vicinity? Anybody like, did you get a sense of, like anyone who was not invited was like spying on this situation? No, I don't know. There was some any like, MIBs. No, I didn't see any, uh, maybe God, there was this one beautiful couple. Oh my God. God, this that was guy my other question. Was like, how like good looking was this star. guy? I want to, I want to <laughs> yeah. know how hot the crowd so was. So bad. This one couple. This guy had a mustache and like a. He looked like uh, Errol Flynn. You know, uh-huh. had a little uh-huh. duck, and he had this like bowling shirt and then a dicky pants and cowboy boots. I was like, this Great guy look. is so That's sexy. Price's yeah. idea of a man. Yeah, yeah. And, and then uh, yeah. and then his girl came in bowling and she shirt was and like caramel skinned curly black hair and i was like this is the sexiest couple i've seen in whatever but there is a it was a i don't know why i'm talking about them <laughs> but it should be listening to the ufo well, they stuff. could have been aliens they could have been aliens. Yeah. yeah you're right yes that's my other question like mm-hmm. anyone whose like face looked like it didn't fit quite right yeah. you know what i mean yeah. w- wearing a trench coat and you see a little green tentacle slip out and take a glass of champagne you know what they were so beautiful they if, if i had to pick an aliens they would have been it couple because they stayed scenes. in yeah. the back they were chill. I was like, kind of like, who invited them? What are they doing here? At one point, you looked back and her eyes were just glowing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Bright white totally. light. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Three inches above the yeah. ground. And then I did yeah. see one guy who was clocking the grounds constantly. So mm. I think there was some sort of security detail yeah. there. You know, this kind of is going to draw some weirdos. But, uh, you know, it, it puts me back on that spectrum of like, man, this is a this is a problem we're contending with here on a planetary scale. And it, uh, you know, it may not be so esoteric but if they were gonna wipe us out why when they do you think they would have wiped us out by now or are we like a farm a lady had a question she was like she was like okay so you're telling me there's all these encounters you know and it sounds like most of them they've all been you know nobody's gotten hurt or anything and and so we can pretty much surmise that they're peaceful right and he's like well two things to that you know he's like there are a number of people in in the military personnel who have been hurt by these by approaching these they're in the government dealing with health their health care and the number of about 160 and also if you wake up that goes back to the 1940s the man tell you and if you go to sleep and you wake up in, in the morning and you see muddy footprints out by your back i mean is that a threat out by your back door. Out by your back door or in, in your on your property. <laughs> not good. Yeah, it's not good, right? We don't yeah. know if it's a threat, but it's worth investigating. Now, what is right? that implying? That they're G-men coming and spying no, on you or that they're occupants? Well, he was saying we, we don't know if what their intent is. How can we know their intent? So we don't know if they're peaceful. It's an analogy. It's I'm, an ana- well, you know, not I'm... Not literal yeah, footprints. Yeah. yeah, okay. I, well, see, I'm watching a lot of X-Files. I told yeah. you we're going... He said you know, this. This is I'm what very, I liked. I'm this very was, much in the... They're, they're, it's a hybridization program. This was I, This is what I like. This was very military. He said, this is how we... Uh, this is how we assess an en- enemy. Attent, capability, right? What's their intent what's their capability Makes sense. well we know these things capability they can outmaneuver us they can out uh they can out track us they can be wherever they want whenever they want now uh they they exceed us in all capability do we know their intent not a single iota of it and uh and so that's why the government has a problem because when they're assessing a potential enemy they need to know intent they need to know capability well we know the capability we don't know the intent yep yikes Let's try to and this, make them not an enemy. And this is go, comes back to why I think if the government knows they exist and they know that they're extraterrestrial, they won't fucking tell us. Mm-hmm. Because the moment 
someone goes, what's their capability? And they tell them, and then they go, well, can they hurt? What are they go, doing? What, are you what doing? do they want? How can you protect us from them? They're going to go, we can't. We can't. We and don't then know. suddenly question government mark, question mark. is irrelevant. Right. They're not going to do it. Um, all right. Awesome report. Yeah. Let us know. with the who's who. Let us hey, know if you become world. a unicorn for that couple. Um, we'll take a quick <laughs> break. When we come back, we're going to have an all new segment specially made for Saucerama. Saucerama. Well, boys and listeners, dear Club Scouts, oh, there's so much high strangeness jam packed into this episode. I can't even tell you. Good. I've got a brand new segment that we're doing. I'm calling it Parade of the Humanoid. Ooh, I love that. We're going to take a look at, uh, at a few strange humanoid cases that were happening in the 1950s here in North America. All right. Beginning with March 1952, the Branch Hill, Ohio, Branch Hill Aliens case, a.k.a. the Loveland Frog Men. Oh. The Frog uh, Men. Wait. Okay. So this is different than the Loveland Frog Man. Yes. Uh-huh. The Loveland Frog Man was in the 70s. No shit. But there's this alien case that we may have talked about in the episode that we did with Joe Manganiello. These guys look like Devo. These guys look like <laughs> Devo. Do. So we're looking at, there is a, uh, I'll put all Frog of these. Devo. I'll put all of this stuff up on the Instagram at Bigfoot Collectors Club. Um, these guys look like reverse hunchbacks. They have like uh, Devo-like wrinkly heads uh -huh. and then like big bulging, kind of like a frog would have, you mm. know, when the frogs like the do throat the, thing. What, yeah, what is that called? I used to know the name of that in elementary school. Oh, the burbot. Yeah, like, burbot. It's called a burbot. <laughs> yeah, it's called a burbot. <laughs> so um, the Branch Hill aliens. Do you know that what that's called when, uh, when you name a sound? Uh, onomatopoeia onomatopoeia yeah. yeah so the following that i'm going to read is a snippet from a report written by ufologist leonard h stringfield in 1957 about this encounter encounter that took place in 1952 okay and the man who saw these three beings was named richard honeycutt dick honeycutt great name Hell yeah, yeah dick honeycutt <laughs> Strong so name. uh this is the report that Stringfield wrote. About 4 a.m. on a March night, 1952, while driving through Branch Hill on his way to Loveland, Honeycutt saw in the beams of his headlights what appeared to be three men kneeling at the right side of the road. His first impression was that somebody was hurt or some crazy guys were having fun. Curious. Was that, is that code for like yeah. sucking each other's yeah, dick? Like, what, are we, <laughs> what are we saying here, Honeycutt? <laughs> Curious. He stopped his car and got out for a better look. To his surprise, he discovered that the figures were non-human and about three feet tall. They were not green, honeycut stressed, but rather a grayish color, including the garments. These tight fitting, these tight fitting stretched over a lopsided chest, which bulged at the shoulder to the armpit. Hmm. Over this bulbousness hung a slender arm, noticeably longer than its op opposite member. <laughs> Save for only a fleeting impression of something baggy, the legs and feet were obscured by weeds and brush. What? Their heads were ugly, said Honeycutt, reminding him of a frog's face, mostly because of the mouth, which spanned in a thin line across a smooth gray face. Mm. While Honeycutt thought the eyes... Uh, without brows, seemed normal, and the nose was indistinct. The pate of the head had a paint uh, a paint it spelling incorrect on like hair effect, oh. like a plastic doll. A p a i n paint it, it on. Oh, paint it on. Dude, is yeah. that dude holding a, a paint wand? it on hair effect? Okay. Oh, could not re. Yes, he added. It was corrugated or like rolls of fat running horizontally over a bald head. Now, when you look at this picture, you see that one of these, uh, he's drawn one of these things as having, uh, holding some sort of wand over its head. Yeah, it looks like one of those Chinese finger puzzles he's caught in. According yeah. to Honeycutt, the middle biped and the one closest to him was first seen with his arms upraised. They were raised a foot or so above the head, he said, and holding a dark chain or stick, which emitted blue-white sparks jumping from one hand to the other. Cool, he's got a sparkler. As Honeycutt approached, she said that this biped then lowered his arm with the chain as if to tie it around his ankles. 
It's a space <laughs> shoelace. Honeycutt said that he wanted to get closer, but by the time he had reached the front fender of his car, the little man made a slight unnatural move toward him as if motioning me not to come any closer. For about three minutes, Honeycutt said that he stood still, just watching, too amazed to be afraid. Next thing he remembered, he was on his way to Fritz's office. Mm. So he had some missing time. Yeah, These totally. things got a hold of him. <laughs> just wait right there. We're going to yeah. zap you. <laughs> These guys are weird, right? Totally bizarre. Yeah. Really bizarre. Really this is one what of I the mean. Stranger ones. It gets fun in the 50s. Now, you said yeah. they had a suit, right? Like the guy said they were wearing uh, They a had suit? gray tight fitting that was stretched over there. How do you tailor a suit for that? Like Not, with that big like it's so It's like a it's more like a jumpsuit or uh, like spandex. Right. Still, Not, it's a very weird shape of these creatures. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Not like a suit and tie. Right. Well, no, I get that. They're wearing a space suit, but I feel bad for their tailor is all I'm saying. Yeah. One of those weird 50s leotards. Right. Okay. So next we have from summer of 1953 from Medford, Oregon. You think the Loveland Frogman is pissed at these guys like fucking stepping Stealing in on his thunder? thunder? Glad you yeah, brought it back up. I mean, you know, because it's like he's had enough, like he gets enough like bullshit on our on our spectrum chart of bullshit or believe it. I, you know, he's lucky he's he even in there. He came after. Oh, he came after. So people think that so maybe this is all kind of the same. This could be connected. Oh. That Loveland seems to have sort of these frogmen frog hanging around. He had star quality while these other ones He was did. in the 70s. That is mm. really weird, though, this predating sort of yeah. frog creature. But his description is different, different from yeah. these guys. Yeah. Right. But why- people just saw him like squatting in a pond. Right. Okay. All right. So, summer 1953, Medford, Oregon, we have the Medford Smooths. <laughs> the Smooths! The Medford Smooths, named after a white globulous cartoon character from the old Little Abner comic strips. You remember Smoo? No. You're too, probably too young. Do you Google Smoo? Smoo. You'll recognize. He's like a, he looks like a squishy bowling pin or like kidney shaped thing with like a, with like a happy face. And he could like turn, he could like morph into different things. I'm on some supplements. Poos, Smoo. Smoo, S-M-O-O-S. Uh, this, this comes from a report that was sent into the Center for UFOs in the mid-80s and was published in their newsletter. Even though it was reported in 1984, the incident took place I've never back- seen this little fucking guy in my You've life. You've never seen the That's smoo? That's a sperm, oh, well, dude. He's, okay, this is actually, clearly a sperm. He's a schmoo in well, the Labner. And he looks like a so, penis and balls. Who drew this guy? A horny cartoonist. Let me see how this is spelled because- it's, Look at it's this. Been- oh, this, is, <laughs> this is obscene. <laughs> Schmooze. Who's this little schmoo thing he is? Schmooting power. With yeah, mystic S-H- schmooting power. S-H-M-O-O. Okay. Look at these little Abner's lovable schmooze with mystic schmooting power. They spelled it. I thought that. I thought it was that, but then they spelled Maybe it wrong they in this report. they called it a schmoo like for the schmoo. They're cool. No, it's not like schmooze, but it's, it's misspelled schmoo. all over the place. <laughs> Hi I mean, there. Were, that we're was, just little schmooze. Those guys were like the... Just schmoo. We got schmoo harmonic power. The schmooze were the baby Yoda of their day, okay? They were very popular. They were like the early of a little Abner. Okay. Breakout character. Um, so anyway, uh, even though this was reported in 84, the incident took place back in the 1950s, witnessed by a family of three. The wife, mother, slash mother of the family, wrote in this letter describing the encounter, which I will now read. I lived near Medford, Oregon in 1953, up in the wooded foothills. My husband, 12-year-old daughter, and I were returning home one evening in the summer at about 10 p.m., We turned off the old stage road to Scenic Avenue, which passed in front of our home. Suddenly, three creatures appeared at the side of the road in our headlights. We stopped, and they seemed to glide across the road at an angle away from us and disappeared into the wooded area there. Mm. They were approximately six feet from our car at first, so we got a good look at them, though it happened in just a few minutes. Seconds, probably. We waited a bit, then drove to our home a quarter mile away. The creatures were about four feet high, with the last one in line slightly smaller. So I'm thinking Papa like Shmoo. ducks. Yeah. yeah, Papa Shmoo, Baby Shmoo, yeah. Mama Shmoo, Baby Shmoo. It's cute. They were white and appeared to have very smooth, satiny fur. Whoa. And their bodies, uh, uh, and their bodies, but we knew they weren't geese. They had no beaks, no apparent wings or arms, seemed totally smooth, and had no visible feet. As I said, they glided rather than walking or running. We saw no features since they were moving sideways from us at first, then away from us before they entered the trees. So we we only knew they had no beak or nose. 
We discussed them at home and agreed they did look like the schmooze in the old little Abner comic strip, but very much bigger and with longer necks. I assure you that we are very normal people. <laughs> <laughs> That's good, good clothes. These guys kind of remind me of the Fresno Nightcrawlers, but yeah. without legs. Mm-hmm. I don't know what to fuck to think of this. Do you think it's because of the comic strip? And it kind of again, puts that image into people's minds and they experienced whatever this paranormal thing I mean, was I as mean, that. I mean, again, this is sort of like, yeah, it makes me think. Like, and they also, so like, yes, are they are they pulling something from the subconscious of the little kid or the family mm-hmm. to to take a form that they might recognize, right? Mm. Or, or relate to. The other thing that I find interesting was there was three of the f- three members of the family and three of these things. Mm. And one of them is a little, and they had a little, they had a daughter with them. So right. I almost feel like this thing is mirroring them in some weird way. Oh, That's interesting. Interesting. I don't know. I have no idea. Or they're ducks and they just don't know what the fuck geese look like or ducks look like. <laughs> I don't know. It's very strange, but they were big. They were like four feet, four feet tall. Yeah. That's a, that's, man, I'd love to see a little family of schmooze. And they glide it. Yeah. The gliding. It's weird. Maybe, I don't know. The satiny fur. It's, there's some it's, details. It's very, here. yeah, surreal. She said we got a good look at them. All right. And then finally, uh, pulling up the, the caboose of our parade of humanoids, mm-hmm. we have on December 16th, 1957, from Old Saybrook, Connecticut, the Old Saybrook Blockheads. <laughs> now, these are fucking surreal. This sounds like Gumby. The old Saybrook blockheads were two entities that were spotted inside a low flying craft in the backyard of retired teacher Mary M. Starr from Saybrook, Connecticut. Around 3 a.m., Starr was woken by a bright light coming from her backyard. When she looked out the window, she saw a craft, which she originally mistook for a downed airplane, but quickly realized it was hovering above her clothesline. Through the porthole of the UFO, she could see two extraterrestrial entities moving about the cabin. Each had a translucent cubed head Mm. with glowing reddish orange spheres spheres floating in the center. Wow. Their bodies were a flowing rubber-like form with billowing appendages for arms and no discernible legs. The sightings last the sighting lasted for several minutes until the windows of the craft vanished and turned solid. An antenna protruded from the hole on one end of the craft and then it shot silently into the air oh that's it awesome gone. it was like transforming to was like warp speed yep and then whatever. when it silent soundlessly went right up into the air dude what gone. is it about backyards uh, man i don't know it's always dude. a backyard also like i thought weird because there was a clothesline and these things kind of look like clothes hanging from a clothesline <laughs> so could she have somehow hallucinated and was actually looking at clothes clothes bill i don't know mm. or are these things like i love the i love the detail of like the windows just went away they didn't close they yeah. just disappeared yeah this one's weird these guys look weird they're fun but i don't like them <laughs> i don't like them i don't like them i like them i, I like too. them too i do like them you have black heads but they're yeah. kind of scary yeah little frogs the schmooze and the blockheads yeah yeah weird humanoids what, what do a you guys parade think? What a parade, what right? A parade, That'd be yeah. very fun. Parade. Enjoyed it. Parade of the humanoids. Mm-hmm. Well, I told you the 1950s are interesting. We're gonna. I'm gonna try to swing back and do this segment again before the summer's over. So don't you worry. Love it. A lot more weirdness where that came from. Okay, we're gonna take a break, and when we come back, it's time for this week's story of high strangeness. <laughs> Okay, Club Scouts, this week for Sasarama, we're going to peer into the enigmatic case of the McMinnville UFO photos, a saga that has captured the imagination of believers and skeptics alike for decades. Now, obviously, there are photos that go along with this, so check out the visual oh, material over. Of course you do. We're going to get into oh, this. shit. Hold your thoughts, because I, I have a moment where you get to get to tell me why how you know about it. Okay. Um but uh, go check these out over on our Instagram, Epic Foot Collectors Club. Okay. The McMinnville UFO photos, a.k.a. the Trent UFO photos, hmm. are two black and white pictures from 1950 that allegedly show a classic saucer hovering over a rural farm in Oregon. If you grew up reading books on the unexplained or watching shows like Unsolved Mysteries, Encounters, or Sightings, then you have definitely seen these photos before. 
The flying saucer in the image is almost as iconic as the Patterson Gimlin Bigfoot or the now debunked surgeon photo of Loch Ness Monster. I'll throw these up on our Instagram as I said, but Bryce and Riley, take a look and let me know if you recognize these. One of them is cropped sure and do. zoomed in. Mm-hmm. These ring a bell? They do. Yeah, it reminds me of like library books. Yes. Being a kid, like that the time paranormal oh, series a hundred must have been in that of for sure they were yeah yeah so yeah also i showed these to kate last night and she goes come on that's a pie pan that's a pan that's a <laughs> that's a top of a of a that's a lid to a pot that's michael a classic mcmillan hoax yeah. i know <laughs> it kind of is but it, maybe or maybe not so here we go in the spring of 1950, the sleepy town of McMinnville, Oregon, became the epicenter of a cosmic event that would seemingly defy rational explanation. On the evening of May 11th, a local farmer, Paul Trent, and his wife, Evelyn, witnessed an otherworldly sight hovering above their farmstead just south of McMinnville. The Trents claimed southeast or southwest. Uh, the Trents claimed to have observed a metallic disc-shaped object gliding silently through the twilight sky an event that would establish their names in the annals of UFO lore forever. Evelyn had been in the yard feeding her rabbits when she looked up and spotted the craft. She described the object like a good-sized parachute canopy without the strings, only silver bright mixed with bronze. Oh, huh. It was pretty as anything I ever saw. This is all happening, by the way, around 7.30. Yeah, so not like a pie pan. So, like, Well, she... That's interesting, though. She's, like a parachute. Yeah. Bellowed. Yeah, where I just think it was a big, yeah, like a big, yeah. big shape like that. Um, Evelyn dashed into the house to grab Paul, who walked out into the yard and observed the object with her for a few minutes before returning to the house to grab his Kodak camera. It was round, shiny, wingless object. It was coming in toward us, and it seemed to be tipped up a little bit. Very bright, almost silvery, and there was no noise. Farmer Trent raised his lens towards the air and snapped two photos of the anomalous craft before it flew off and vanished from sight. Now sidebar moment here uh this comes up a little bit later but this was not the first time that evelyn had seen flying saucers Mm. Ah. and a lot of people who are skeptical about it were like well this is a lady who says she sees flying saucers so how can we believe that you know what i mean right this is back in the day when like if you had an interest in the subject you were suspicious right right just like you know the patterson gimlin stuff like well they were shooting a bigfoot documentary and we're we're to believe that they actually caught bigfoot on camera Mm -hmm. right it seems to be that most people find these stories valid when the person is someone who's like i'm just a normal joe who doesn't ever think about these things yeah farmer's only as good as his word so back to the evening of may 11th 1950 now most of us who if we found ourselves in this situation especially considering that this was the golden age of the flying saucer we'd most likely immediately hop into our pickup truck and drive down to the local pharmacy to get this world of film developed too sweet Mm -hmm. but that's not what the trends did instead they waited until they had used up the whole roll of film yeah film's expensive it is expensive (laughs) uh which occurred a few days later on may 14th do you want to know what that day was what 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 they used up the film roll on well that was my son's uh fourth grade graduation close it was mother's day (laughs) oh so they had pictures of a mother's day picnic and once they used up the film they're like all right let's go get it um and there might be some ufos on there too so be careful (laughs) careful back in your lab don't get any light on there yeah that is interesting though because this is like an era where consumer cameras are really starting to like spread cool Mm -hmm. so like this is like you know 1950s kodak brownie or like Mm -hmm. just like uh, where it's starting to be like an object that you have in your home like the radio you yeah know? cool so it's like a uh, prime time for something like this to become this iconic moment. yeah yeah again it's all kind of coming to get coalescing at the same time you know all at once it's mm-hmm. funny i didn't really think about that but yeah before then you would have to go to a professional photographer right or or like the the photo would take so long to expose or whatever we're starting to where people are trying to have you know actual very Camera. usable cameras That's in their cool. homes yeah i love that yeah 
So, uh, after that lovely Mother's Day, um, and with the roll containing genuine flying saucers finally used up, Paul took the canister of film into town where he had the pictures developed. The Trents claimed that at first they were nervous about coming forward with the pictures because they were worried they'd perhaps, you know, had captured a secret military craft in a test flight and they would have been harassed by the military if they showed it to anyone. So instead, Farmer Paul gave one of the photos to his banker, Frank Wartman. <laughs> And tickled and intrigued by Trent's encounter, Wartman hung the photos up in the local bank (laughs) where they eventually caught the attention of a local reporter, Bill Powell. So Powell uh, interviewed... I know what to do with these. (laughs) Yeah. Wait a minute. We're going to hang them in the bank. (laughs) So Powell interviews the Kents or the Trent's and takes the negatives in for analysis. He's like, I'd like to have these negatives, please. Can I go take a look at these? So they're like, sure, here you go. And uh, he concluded that the object appeared in the image which was captured on film so it's in the negative there was no you know pre you know uh, photoshop shenanigans no going on. and on june 8th a uh, story about the sighting as well as the photos were published on the front page of his local uh, newspaper the mcminnville telephone register below the attention grabbing headline which read at long last authentic photographs of flying saucer question <laughs> mark on June 11th, the Trents appeared on an Oregon radio show and shared their story. The news spread, obviously, like wildfire. And being the golden age of the Flying Saucer Life magazine got into the game and reprinted the photos in a multi-page spread. Those are the photos that we've seen reprinted over and over again. Uh, cropping the original photos for a better look at the McMinnville Saucer. Suddenly, the Trents UFO photos were a national news item. Wow. During all of the hubbub, the negatives were passed around. Time Magazine ensured the Trents they would get the negatives back to them and then claimed to have misplaced them. Sure, Time mm. Magazine. Huh. Um, oh, I said Time. It's Life Magazine. Sorry. Life mm. Magazine. Life Magazine. Um, so around this time, an intelligence officer came out to, uh, from the USAF to interview the couple. They told him the same story they told everyone else, and the Air Force intelligence found it difficult to debunk the photos, and or at least showed to have a little motivation to do so. So this these photos now exist. They're out there. Yeah. They're out there for everyone to talk about over the 1950s. And for the next few decades, the McMinnville UFO photos rested comfortably in the hallowed halls of flying saucer lore as the genuine article. Mm-hmm. But the photos didn't come without controversy. Uh, it's a photo of a flying saucer, after all. Critics of the McMinnville UFO photos have raised numerous objections, ranging from claims of photographic manipulation to suggestions of mundane explanations such as misidentified weather phenomena or aircraft. However, proponents of the Trent's account point to the lack of evidence supporting any of these alternative theories, insisting that the photos depict uh, the real deal. In 1967, so we're jumping ahead now, the original negatives were discovered in the files of the United Press International, and which was like a big press conglomerate. So somehow they went. Oh, so they really life, did lose them. And they lost them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I do think I they, can see that happen. I do think they ended up in the hands of the military for a while. For a while. I, I'm sure yeah. the they must Air have. Force got the negatives must have. from Life, and then they they got placed somewhere back in some sort of national archive pool. Of, that makes sense. Of, not the national archives, but you know, right. This, this United Press International. So they were found basically in a drawer or a file and they were given to astronomer William K. Hartman. Hartman was working for the Condon Committee, which was the late 60s version of the military's attempt to get to the bottom of all this UFO stuff. Hartman looked into the Trent story and the photos and he was pretty impressed with what he saw. I was. I was impressed. This was one of the few UFO reports in which all factors investigated geometric, psychological, and physical appear to be consistent with the assertion that an extraordinary flying object, silvery, metallic, disc-shaped, tens of meters in diameter, and evidently artificial, flew with inside of, of two witnesses. In a contradictory statement, however, Hartman admitted that it was possible that the whole thing could have been hoaxed, offering a rudimentary example as how as to how the trends might go about staging such a feat. However, I do feel I need, need to say, as impressed as I was, 
The object appears beneath a pair of wires, as is seen in plates 23 and 24. We may question, therefore, whether it could have been a model suspended from one of the wires. This possibility is strengthened by the observation that the object appears beneath roughly the same point in the two photos, in spite of their having been taken from two positions. These tests do not rule out the possibility that the object was a, a small model suspended from the nearby wire by an unresolved thread. So there you go. In put, that, put that in your pipe and smoke it. In 1975, but he, I will, he did. I wasn't. Impressed. He did turn turn it back to the Condon Committee and say, I think this might be real. I did say that. that those were my words. Sir, can you just go back to 1967 now, please? Yeah, I thank gotta you. go. Okay. okay, thank you. In 1975, the original negatives now in the hands I'm of... I'm sorry, wait, which uh, way sir, is the portal? It's, the, uh, <laughs> it's the, just been the bathroom. No, yeah, okay. In the bathroom. Right. Walked right through the shower. Thank you, boys. You got it. In 1975, the original negatives now in the hands of Bruce McAbee. Is that a Bigfoot painting? All right, <laughs> sir. Okay, sir. You really it's, have had enough time to talk. <laughs> Uh, Bruce Maccabee, an optical physicist for the U.S. Navy and a ufologist, were put through the gauntlet under new, a new study. Maccabee painstakingly went through the image looking for any signs of a model being used, including a hy hypothetical fishing line that might be used to hang the flying saucer from the power lines in question, and came to the conclusion that the saucer was, in fact, not a model, but an object set some distance into the photo's background. That's cool. In his learned opinion, Maccabee concluded that the Trent photos displayed a, quote, real physical object, end quote, flying over the Trent farmstead. Wow. Despite the scrutiny of the negatives over the years, skeptical opinions remain that the image was a hoax, mostly based on the fact that Evelyn had shown interest in UFOs before the photo was taken. In the 1980s, two debunkers, notorious UFO skeptic Philip J. Class and the noted climate change denier and anti-feminist Robert Schaefer uh, tried there's to... There's a couple of goons. <laughs> yeah, tried to undo Maccabee's analysis from 1975 by comparing the shape of the craft to that of, uh, the round, of round side mirrors used on Ford <clears throat> vehicles in that era. They also pointed to... Uh, a little bit of inconsistency in the Trent story over the decades. If Fords flew. <laughs> well, they, they were talking about popping, they like threw the mirror up. The side what? mirror yeah. broke it off because they were circular yeah. and tossed it into the air like I did when it, I was yeah. a kid. It took does a photo of it. Kind of look like come. that. Um, <laughs> so there also were some little inconsistencies in the Trent stories over the decades. I think this might be just chalked up to two old people telling their story over and over again. Sure. Um, but uh, they claimed that they had lied about what time of day the event took place. They concluded this by looking at the, by saying that the picture was taken in the morning, not in the evening, as evidenced by the lighting in the photo mm. and how shadows fell on the barn. Despite the negative pushback, Maccabee rebuked these Hell yeah. and further skeptical analysis done by a group of skeptics called IPOC in the, in 2013. So this is still being debated. Maccabee's the shit. I want to talk more about him. He said that the cloud cover present in the evening of the photo could explain shadows on the garage and suggested that the morning timeline and that the uh, that suggested the morning timeline and that uh, regarding quote regarding the ipox photogrammic analysis i show that the siding lines did not cross under the wires and they did not refute this i still stand on my original Hell yeah work. this there guy is a navy optical physicist uh, he is the shit. And did you know um, that later in his life he would confront his own high strangeness with UFOs? Oh, really? Oh, yeah, absolutely. So you know Maccabee, you're a fan. Oh, yeah, okay. absolutely. This guy has looked at sort of all... Uh, I remember him on shows like In Search Of and Unsolved Mysteries. He would be the guy that you would go to and be like, hey, is this is this footage or has this been edited or fooled with in any way? So he was the guy He's to the go guy. to. Wow. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Fast forward to I'm watching David Polites, uh Missing 411, The Hunted, mm -hmm. right? And at the end segment, do you know who they have on there? They have on Navy optical physicist Bruce Maccabee. Well, apparently his wife, Jan, was out hunting uh, in their back lot because they live on some property. I think it's somewhere on the East Coast. Okay. Uh, and there's a reserve back there. Uh, so she's in her deer blind when... All of a sudden, the noise goes quiet, and a buzz sort of takes over the environment. The Oz effect. The Oz in. effect mm -hmm. kicks in. She sees this 
thing, this sort of transparent, like the predator cloaked, swinging through the trees What? Whoa. until it lands in a tree right in front of her. Now, being the wife of optical physicist Bruce McAbee, she goes, oh my God, I need to take a picture. Well, she did. She pulls out her digital camera and she flashes a picture. And then she goes about her hunting. And she gets home and Bruce like, how was, how was everything? Oh, everything was fine. Um, and he goes, you will not believe the call I just got. And she goes, oh yeah? Yeah, it's from our nephew. He's at band practice. Jan Maccabee is her name. Jan Maccabee, his Googling. wife. And uh, he goes, yeah, they're over at band camp. Uh, they're at band practice at the school. There's their UFO in the sky right now. They're all seeing it. She what? goes, what? She goes, yeah, he's just saw it. The whole, the whole band. And he goes, she goes, oh my God, there was something in the woods in the back. And he goes, oh, oh my God, I took a picture. Well, she, she took a picture and as being Bruce McAbee goes, give me the fucking camera. <laughs> he grabs the digital camera and he takes a look at it and in this camera he sees i have the picture in this camera he sees you have the photo with you i do this is great we didn't plan any it. of this none of it because yeah. i'm looking for it online right now i can't i don't know yeah how to Google it. you won't find it he sees i gotta go to my expedition <laughs> bigfoot thing uh, okay uh, let me find this thing anyway he sees in this camera like these squiggly lines looks like hair right and he goes holy shit but more importantly he goes this isn't an aspect ratio that this camera doesn't even support. What? And she goes, what? And he goes, yeah, this fucking digital camera, this photo, this single photo is in an aspect ratio that the settings on this camera cannot even do. So like the camera, something like was messed with the camera the sensor. Yeah, absolutely. Now, the reason I was interested in this photo is because on expedition Bigfoot, when something passed by one of our trail cameras, I said, Holy shit. Oh, is this when that, there was like the fur? Yes. Up close I to said the that fucking fur looks exactly what like Jan Maccabee was talking about. And, uh, and I did, I sort of put, put them up uh, identical to each other and oh my gosh, lo and behold, they do look so similar. I'll find it. I'll throw up on our Instagrams, okay. but, but, uh, you know, fascinating that sort of this stuff ended up like confronting him later in his life too. Anyway, is it this, uh, oh my gosh. Uh, no, I, I don't think so. It might be hold on. Well, uh, while you look, oh, I have it right here. I okay, found, great. I think I found Bryce it finally. Got it. Okay, I'll show you, boys. I'm in my. There's a Reddit thread. There's a Reddit. There's a oh, Reddit is there a Reddit thre thread? Of course, okay. there's always, always a Reddit, Reddit thread. Okay, well then you've probably uh, found it. Let me see if I can't find this old Brian. Does anyone remember a video of a woman hunter? Um, uh, and a caught. Yeah, it was our missing four one one. The hunted. Uh, ch -ch -ch -ch. Well, I can't find the picture, boys, but I'll put it up on the. Uh, is this one? Yes, that's it. Let me that's, see. That's Riley. it right there. Is this uh, the one that. That's the I don't picture. Know if you can turn your yeah. laptop towards me without killing her. Oh yeah. Okay. Now, I've seen yeah. this. Now seen I did a this. side. I saw that on Expedition. Yes, yeah. I did yes. a side by like, side because it looked like the exact same thing. It's very. It's up close to the camera. Mm, can't find it. Right. Yeah. Yes. Not like. Uh, yeah. It's pretty close. Yeah. Hers was close. She said she, hers was in the tree right in front of her okay. when she took that photo. Well, Crazy. that's awesome. Great sidebar. So basically the Trent UFO photos come down to the same division lines as the Patterson Gimlin film. It's either a gorilla suit, or in this case, a toy model, or it's the genuine article. Mm. Despite the passage of time, the McMinnville UFO photos continue to capture the imaginations of both amateur enthusiasts and seasoned researchers. Their enduring legacy serves as a testament to the enduring allure of the unexplained, prompting us to ponder the mysteries that lie beyond the bounds of our understanding. This wet, hot alien summer, dear Club Scouts, as we continue to gaze skyward in search of answers, let us not forget the humble farmer and his wife oh, yeah. who found themselves at the center of a cosmic conundrum in the heart of rural Oregon. Mm. Love farmers. Willie Nelson, shout out. <laughs> there you go. The McMinnville photos. It's a story behind an image you've probably seen a hundred times. Cool, now, man. Looking at. I do love how like folksy it all is. Yeah. The way it kicks off and gains steam to a national news story. By the end of his, they both died in like 97 and 98. She died, before, Evelyn died before Paul. And by the end of the 90s, he was like, I don't want to talk about this anymore. But yeah, she still right. loved telling Enough. the story. Right. Right. She loved telling the story. And 
And um, that like makes me believe it more too. <laughs> yeah, and I think another inconsistency yeah. was like they could tell it was they could tell that the photos were taken a couple minutes apart, not a couple seconds apart, and stuff like that. So that's a big. Thing. But they never they they did say they were watching it for a while. Those things do meander in the air. You know, yeah. people say they observe them for minutes. minutes you this know? was have this, yeah. this took that's place. That's true. Over I the, you're really firing off two this, frames. This took place over the course of 15 minutes at least, and then. Um, the uh, I lost my train of thought, but um, there was another. I, I think. Well, I don't remember. I that's just okay. totally went blank. <laughs> oh, what that's okay. I got my Hardest work that's in the world. You, got, you got, too got too close to the truth. I got too close to the truth. That's what just oh, happened. Exactly, right bro. Yeah. yeah. And they were like, mm, not yet. Uh, no, uh, <laughs> but they, um, yeah, he he didn't love talking about it towards the end. He was sick of it, but she she, she loved it. Um, oh, the thing I was going to say was they never really profited off. They never made any real money off. They didn't of it. sell. Yeah, they they weren't. They weren't doing the. I don't. They may have done some interviews and stuff, and I wouldn't be surprised if they did some like talk about it, UFO circles and stuff. But they didn't make money off yeah, this thing, right? And right. like they went, they gave it to a, a, a basically a neighbor to hang up in his bank. I love right. that you know part. I mean? yeah. That's like one of my. Favorite. It was a novelty to yeah, them. I don't totally. think. Yeah, that's a saucer. Flew to town. I, yeah. I don't think yeah. there was a real reason to hoax it. You know, it's the oddities in stories like that that we look for that sort of sort you know s s scream humanality. You yeah. know, mm -hmm. so. Well, before we head over to Collector's Corner, let's thank some Club Scouts who've recently joined us let's over on BCC, that, the other side. You, you know what? Because, you know, yeah, I do want to, because I'll tell you why I want to, because, well, well, it's because those who join the other side that really keep this train on the yeah. tracks, because <laughs> the saucer stays in the air because the of you stays are in the, the invisible air. wire. Yes. Yeah, so yes. If you're thinking Holding about us it, aloft. It's true. <laughs> come on over and, and, and help hold up our UFO, because we do this out of love, man. We don't get paid no. except uh, for your guys' support, and yeah. we love making this show for enough. you. Um, oh yeah, yeah. but uh, yeah, you know a what? little bit. I mean, come it's on. a little. It's not. It's, it's not, not as much as you would think. <laughs> yeah. you would think. <laughs> We're selling our souls for very little money. Here. I feel like this is me keeping my soul. Making listen, yeah. yes, yes. I'll tell you that. You know what? Yes. Join the community. Join the conversation, and uh, support local artists and, like us. And don't forget. We're doing lots of Sasarama fun over yeah, there. It's so. fun over there. Yeah. Movie club, book club, us club. I haven't done a book in a while. Um, <laughs> Ales Mato. Thank you. Uh, Arna Matthias. Cosmeteer. Thank you, Arna. Welcome. J3J11 Beauchamp. Thanks, Jay. Peter Swenson. Thank you, Peter. Christopher Pohl. Thanks, Chris. Christopher Pohl. Excuse my mispronunciation. Nona Meyer. Thanks, Nona. Kirk. Now, Plamerton. Plamerton? Plamerton. Plamerton. I don't think that's true, but... Kirk, I'll owe you another shout out if I misspell this. Kirk Plamerton, Cosmeteer. Thank you and welcome. And favorite name of the week, Mermaider666, Cosmeteer. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you and welcome. Join us. I think it's Palmerton. It's Kirk Palmerton. Well, now we've said both. Yes. So. Kirk Plamerton, you get a free shout out. Yeah, there you go. Uh, join us at patreon.com slash Bigfoot Collectors Club and unlock total access to BCC with three bonus apps every month. Access to the entire exclusive episode, archives, the BCC Discord, and more. Upgrade to the Cosmeteer membership. You get the most bang for your buck over there. You'll unlock three bonus music tracks every month from producer Riley and ad-free episodes like the one you're listening to right now. Okay, it's time to cross over to Collector's Corner. Ooh. Guys, what's your jam this week? Mm. Yeah, you, you didn't go last week. It's your turn. Oh, I, I'm on the spot here. I'm not collecting any meatball subs. Oh yeah, <laughs> I'm collecting calories. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, he's bulking. And then bulking. He's gonna, we have a little segment of just like give us some yoked alchemy. Yeah, yoke Bryce's yoked alchemy. Yeah, yeah. What like, do you walk mean? us through like what? How many sets? How many reps? What are we talking? What do we do? Okay, well, teach yeah. us, teach us, Riley's teach us soft boys how to yes, work out. Yes. <laughs> We're bread boys. We don't yeah. have any meatballs in between those slices. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh my god. What do you got? Uh, what, what's a good What's a good place to start? You know, a good place to start is uh, here's here's what I did, uh, it, and the, you could start with anywhere. And it, I wanted to just make a goal for myself using a simple sentence, and 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 for me, mine was I'm gonna go this many days, no matter what. And the no matter what was no the important. It was the important part. And, and so, like uh, like when you hear people do a 30-day yes, yoga challenge. Because it doesn't matter what you do once you get there. You've gotten there, and you've mm -hmm. defeated the resistance. Um, if you've ever read Stephen Pressfield's War of Art... I have not. He talks about this strange... War of Art? War of Art. Oh, cool title. See what it's a there. tiny little book. It's so powerful. He talks about... He wrote Legend of Bagger Vance 
And okay. uh, uh, but he he didn't become a writer until his late forties, early fifties. Uh, he was just living in his van until he finally confronted himself and said, "Fuck it, just write, goddammit. it!" Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and so he he wrote this book and and he noticed this thing called resistance and and it's this force and resistance. And I think oh, you don't write to write tomorrow. You, just, you know, do do that. You got to totally. do this today. Mm-hmm. That, that's I, resistance. I, that rest. I fight yeah. this all the time. That's mm-hmm. resistance. And so once you can recognize it, you can fight. It. You could say, "Well, I recognize you're resisting me from what I need." to do so and i'm gonna do that and so for going to the gym the hardest part about the gym is not lifting the weights it's not any of that stuff it's the resistance that comes before yes and even Hmm. going as many times as i do and i've now it's a habit now i love it i find the resistance is still the same and if it's if i so on a break day or if i miss a day and i'm gonna go back the next day i'm excited but then it starts to start lacing up my shoes resistance sneaks in and goes man you just you did two days off i go i'm tired i'm hurt yeah resistance and it yeah. just it's uh-huh. so sneaky and it lasts all the way up until i get in my car dude you're you don't gotta get gas don't get just get gas and turn back around you gotta get groceries would you have time for this today resistance resistance yeah. resistance all the way until i fucking hit the scanner at the gym i said fuck well i guess we're doing this yeah <laughs> you wow. know and it's like yeah I, wow. we are motherfucker wow. <laughs> I, I deal with that every day on multiple things especially working out i i've been it can be anything i've been what a, better what a great answer to that question mm. great answer yeah. i've been i've been i'm getting back into it it's been hard mm. this i have had such a mental fog over me this year since my mom passed away. Yeah, it is sure. fucking tough to fight through grief, man. Yep, yep. But um, but I've been, I've kind of with my therapist. I've been like, just just do the days you can get it done right now, and don't beat yourself up. That's what it is. So, but I will say in my in my good patterns mm-hmm. of working out, the thing that I always tell myself to fight that resistance mm-hmm. is I go, well, I've never regretted having worked out. Mm-hmm. I've certainly That's regretted having not worked out. Yeah. Yeah. So I go, yeah, I will it'll I will not be mad I did this today. And then I, that is the thing that forces me to just get up and do it. For sure. And listen, I've gotten into the gym and gone, okay, well, yeah. I don't want to be here. Maybe I'll do this or that. And it's not a great workout, but I'm like, doesn't matter. I still walk out and go, fucking came. Showed up. Fucking came and showed up. Yeah. You know, and and, and look, it doesn't have to be the gym for you. It can be and it can be writing. It can be uh something your hobby that you love, your your something that you're driven to. It, for me, it's just the gym. For you, it could be anything, right? But once you start to recognize the resistance, what's keeping you from it, it's so nefarious and so pernicious. And uh, and you just want to be like, hey, fuck you, you're keeping me from my better self. Fuck you, you know, and you do it just to spite, you know. So yeah. um, that's it, man. I'm feeling motivated. Yeah, man. That's yeah, great. that's it. I, I love. That. I go to the gym three days that. a week, no matter what. Great, no matter what. God, the three days you isn't know, that much. We make this yeah. podcast. That's the, yeah. <laughs> no matter what. Yeah, exactly. That, that's right. That's podcast right. Podcast is my gym right now. Yeah. Um, speaking of which, we're gonna cross over to the other side. Saucerama continues all summer long. If we don't see you there, we'll see you back here next week on an all new episode of Yoked Out with Bryce Johnson. Yeah. Until then, good night. So go get repressed, brother. Yeah. Bigfoot Collectors Club is executive produced by Michael McMillan, Riley Bray, and Bryce Johnson. Our show is engineered, produced, and scored by Riley Bray. Our theme song, Come Alone, is by Sun Eaters. Follow them on Spotify. Want more BCC? For exclusive full-length episodes every month and total access to the other side, check out patreon.com slash Bigfoot Collectors Club.